Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the Smart Quiz Seminar. Our speaker today is Professor Lin Bu from North Carolina State University. So she will talk about uh, modeling, uh, developing digital models for uh, distributed energy resources. Uh, our next seminar is in two weeks, May 18th. Uh, so not next week, it's two weeks. So we we have two more presentations on uh, low flexibility and demand side management. And so, if you have any questions uh, for those who participate on online, you should use the Q and A feature to send us the questions. They will, they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So, a quick introduction of the speaker today. Uh, professor Lu is is a professor in the ECE department at North Carolina State University. Uh, this is a traditional powerhouse in power system. There are a few traditional powerhouses. This is one of them. And uh, she's a fellow IEEE and has over 30 years of experience in electric power engineering. She received her PhD from RPI in 2002. And from 2003 for 10 years, she was a senior research engineer with Pacific Northwest National Lab. This is in the uh, state of Washington. Washington or Washington? Dr. Lu's research includes load monitoring and control, energy management systems, renewable integration, microgrid monitoring and control, uh, real time large scale co simulation systems, and metadata analysis. She has published more than 200 papers. And without further delay, I'll uh, let Dr. Lu share her slides and start her presentation. Yeah, I can share. So uh, it's a great pleasure um, for me to uh, come all this way, talk with you, the future uh, engineers, policy makers, hopefully. Uh, our future depends on you. <laughs> so that's why I take all the time and then travel this far. And then I hope that uh, the time will be well spent. I know that most of you do not have a solid uh, power system background. Rather, you probably have a mix of engineering and uh, um, maybe um, law or uh, economics. So I'm not going to um, talk too much about the, the uh, technical details. Rather, I will introduce uh, this uh, power system digital twin as an environment that uh, you can use to do your own research or study. So our work is uh, mainly sponsored by the Department of uh, Energy. And then we worked with uh, New York Power Authority and uh, uh, Strata Solar, who is a solar developer and then municipal utilities. Uh, the reason I mention that is because uh, our research is built on the real system uh, model and data. Uh, and then we work with uh, these utilities uh, and solar developers closely to get the real data sets to build this digital twin. So those are the students involved in the study. Uh, we have been working on this for about uh, six years now. So uh, it's a, a cl uh, collaborative uh, effort. Um, so here's the outline of today's uh, talk. And first, I'm going to give you an overview for the PARS platform we developed. Uh, I maybe focus on the design considerations uh, and then tell you why, uh, among so many PARS system simulation systems, this approach is unique. And then I'm going to talk about these uh, key supporting technologies. Uh, I won't have time to go over all of them, so I'm going to focus on three aspects, co-simulation, synthetic data and scenario generation, and the control and energy management of the system modeling. So first, I'm going to introduce uh, this platform to you. Here is uh, uh, the structure of this platform. You can see that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a model from the bottom 
which is every building, home school, and then we aggregate them up to power distribution system, and then that includes the PV arms here at a five megawatt level, and this is 100 megawatt level. And then these are just tens of uh, KW. You can think about this as a rooftop PV systems, and then this is a solar farm out in the field. Then this is a large scale solar farms. The reason we model them uh, uh, in different way is because these are distributed down in the bottom, very small in capacity, but they're large in quantity. And then they integrate into the power grid through the distribution system. And then for these large, like 100 or 500 megawatt solar farms, they directly integrate into the power transmission system. And then they can provide larger grid services. For example, Black Star or uh, regulation service directly by themselves. But uh, for these distributed energy resources, you have to aggregate them all together. You have to have an aggregator for them to be able to uh, provide services. So we model those in a uh, real-time simulation platform. So a lot of you probably haven't heard of it, OPRT. It is a FPGA-based uh, real-time simulator. So real-time simulation is different from uh, the traditional way of simulating grid. Uh, one second elapsed on this uh, distribution system is actually one second in the real world. Why we want to do that? Because when we build this test system, we want to make it a digital twin so that we can connect the equipment to this test system instead of testing this equipment in field. In that case, we need the simulation system to actually mimic what will happen in field, meaning one second elapsed in the system is actually one second elapsed in field. So that's why we use this uh, real-time simulator, uh, the platform, to build our model. Hardware in the loop is HIL. You're going to see that a lot as well. It means that uh, from our system, we can connect it to, say, a solar panel, an inverter, which is an actual equipment. We can also connect that externally to a control control system, not necessarily a piece of hardware, but uh, a software. Like uh, we have a control energy management system on my computer. I can link it uh, to this uh, hardware in the loop simulation system and then take the data out and decide what to do and then feed the control command back to the system. That way, that system modeled uh, in this HL test bed will actually not only be able to model what the system uh, will do, but also model how the response will be. Meaning, if I take action, the system will know that, and then it will react to my action. So this is the idea behind that. This is a uh, structure of the test system. We have uh, a piece of hardware. We build one test system there, but the power grid is large. You know that transmission system have thousands of nodes. Distribution system also have hundreds or thousands of nodes. So how we solve this stability issue, we can put one system in one core, and then we can model them in multiple core. For example, in our case, we model microgrids, or these uh, solar panels or inverters in one core, and then the distribution system on another. And then we have our collaborators. This is a national lab. They model the whole New York transmission system on another core. And then this is a uh, our, uh, another collaborator in South Carolina, this is in uh, Washington, and this is us in North Carolina. So our system models different parts of the system, but we can connect the system together through VPN link or a simple file transfer. For example, we have this uh, Texas uh, UT Austin. We can send our command to their um, panel and then their inverter to control that inverter's action. And then that action will be feed back to us, and then we know how this action would be as if in field. And then we can feed this uh, action, the result of it, to uh, say in and out, and they are modeling transmission level impact. So by doing so, we can have an integrated uh, test system. We can model from a, a rooftop panel all the way up to a transformer, to a distribution feeder, and then to the transmission line. So this is our idea. So we can distribute our models to different simulation platforms, and then we can connect them together as a network of digital twins to model larger systems. So we've expanded the scalability by doing that. 
So what is the fundamental challenges we're trying to resolve when we, um, when DOE paid us like six million dollars? What we're going to deliver to them? First of all, what is the current system cannot do that we can do? The current system is lack of adaptability. Adaptability is very important because you have a one model developed and then usually utility won't update that until a year later or maybe several years they use the same parameter for that system and then there's snapshots so they won't adapt to the actual field measurement. What we are trying to do is uh, we want to not only make the system realistic, meaning they can accurately represent the physical system behavior, the past system behavior, because you're using historical data to drive that, but also you run it in online and then in real world you can collect the measurement. We can use that measurement to change our parameter so they can adapt to different operation conditions. So what is the response? Responsiveness means I can take control actions. In the past, we have a simulation test system. It runs based on the fixed control setting. But right now, what we're trying to do is that we connect our test system with the control system. Whenever we respond to a real world scenario, we take an action, this test system would get that action, open the breaker or uh, raise the load or uh, based on the price, drop the load. That responsiveness need to be modeled. So we need this system to be scalable, meaning we cannot just model a small city because this whole regional grid included tens of cities or hundreds of cities. So we need to make this scalable and then capture this uncertainty and variability, meaning in real world, there are a lot of measurement errors. If you, in your simulation system, you have this really clean sine wave, then when you design your control circuit, it will not have any error because it doesn't really model the noise. So a real digital twin should be able to model these uncertainty and variability in real world as well. And the last, when we have all these models developed, we need to make the model more compact because we cannot rely on extensive computing platforms. For example, we pay uh, 70K just to get uh, one or two cores at half. So if you want to build a, a larger system, that means you have to spend millions of dollars just on the computing platform. So we need to strike a balance between accuracy and complexity. So this idea is very similar to um, train and AI for self-driving vehicles. You won't ask a human to sit in that vehicle and drive around the world and trying to train your AI. The majority AI will be pre-trained in a simulated environment where you can model the cars. They are driving here and then when your model is more responsive, that means this car see you, it will take an action. You need to be able to model that. Otherwise, you take a picture here and then you take the position here. If it's a static model, it's a snapshot. And then these um, people walking on the street will not move. And then when you train a model using these uh, fixed objects, it won't be responsive. So that's why we wanted the whole thing, not only be mimicking where exactly this position is, but when time goes by, these object will move around as if there's a human moving around. So I'm using this as an example. These are the measurements you took from the real world, and then you will model these human being in your fictitious world, making them move based on their reaction. I see a car coming. I won't stand there making it hit me. I will probably walk and then see the signal and then walk or not, Just make that decision as well. So here's the, the, the um, design consideration for our platform. First of all, we use the past data, we will focus the future. Ideally, we only need one set of parameter that based on the past, I can accurately focus the future. However, in real life, your model of parameter will only be accurate for certain operation condition for certain set of action. So what will happen is at this point of time, I might take an action and then I use still the fixed parameter, then what will happen? you'll see this is what will happen in real world. But your model system probably will go down like that. And then the model the world in the real world will start to depart from each other. Then if you're still using this model to make a decision, then you won't make the right decision. So that's why we need to make it uh, adaptive and responsive. Because when there's an action here, I either 
change this model so you can respond to it. Or if I don't have a response mechanism, I change my model, making the parameter change reflect that change. Okay. So if I at this point detect the arrow is greater than a threshold, then I'll go back, use this uh, real time measurement to decide what would be the model parameter I will use from this point after. So I can make a model adapt to the new situation. So this is the design philosophy. You can see that uh, for those of you who have very little part system background, I'll tell you how the major component to build a part system model would be. First of all, you need to model topology because part system is a huge network. This is a transmission system. A, reg a regional power grid at least will have 2,000 buses to re reflect all these generators, equipment, and then all the load here, you will have an aggregated load. But each load here is actually representing another thousand of nodes, which is a distribution system. This particular node probably will be San Francisco. And then here you probably have tens of feeders out there. So in the old days, what you would do is that you will first decide what would be the topology. And second, on this topology, these will be generators. These arrows will be loaded. What are these models would be? And then you parameterize them. In the old days, these are single phase model because in transmission level, ABC phases, they are mostly balanced. So I can use one phase model the rest of the phase. However, in distribution system, you supply single phase load. On that phase, you can have tens of loads. And then on phase B, you have uh, maybe uh, 20 loads. And then on phase C, you have five loads. So they're unbalanced. You can see this different color represent different phases. So they use a different type of models. So traditionally, they're modeled separately. And then we also will model steady state. You can see that if you have these slow changes, that's steady state model. And then dynamic model is you suddenly have a generator drop offline, frequency will change suddenly. And then you from one steady state moving to another steady state, that's how we call it dynamic model. So in the old days, we used a fixed set of parameters determined by historical data. So in the new day, like what we propose right now, what's the, the advancement of technology compared with the, this existing state of the art? What is our advancement? So in the old days, we use a worst case scenario, only a few snapshots. So for one year, you probably study 10 cases, 10 snapshot peak load scenario, that's it. And then your load parameter or model parameter, they update once a year or even longer. But nowadays, we have a lot of distributed energy resources. What that means to the system? We need to have a lot of uh, distributed energy resources integrated into the distribution system. They aggregate it together. They will have a significant impact on transmission. So now we need an interface between transmission and distribution. The transmission need to not know one load for the whole day. It need to know that uh, when time passed by, every 30 minutes, give me an update of your newest load. What is the status of your distributed resources? So nowadays, the first thing is we need to model distributed energy resources. And the second thing is that the transmission distribution need to be modeled together. Because there are so many distributed resources integrated directly to distribution that their aggregated impact start to affect the transmission grid operation. And then the next uh, change will be steady state and the dynamic. They need to be modeled together. Why is that? Because these smaller um, distributed resources, when there's a fault happen here, a lot of them may be shed offline. And then that the dynamic response will decide what will be your next uh, steady state operation is. So we need to model the dynamics in order to know what the next steady state operation point is. So the last piece is uh, we need uh, not only time series simulation, but to dynamically calculate and validate uh, the model, whether or not they can mimic the actual world behavior. So we need to dynamically calculate and validate the model parameters using the measurement data. And then the system typologies, we cannot use only one typology because when we have this many uh, renewable in the system, they can be taken offline 
because uh, the wind is not blowing, the sun is not shining, they, they don't generate it. And then you have dispatched some other generator from remote and then change the topology to do that. So if you use only one topology model, the whole scenario is obviously not going to cover all the operation condition. So we need more scenarios to design the control so it uh, can adapt to all these kind of uh, different operation scenarios, okay? So the last piece of change is right now we have communication networks. So you not only need to model the physical system, but also the control system. Like I said, you have a vehicle. You drive on the road. You need to make a decision based on how many people are crossing the road to decide if you uh, slow down, wait for how long for them to pass. Same thing here. We need to have a control system based on the actual grid operation condition, decide whether or not I need to redistribute our power flow to compensate for, for example, one area, the wind is not blowing, I need to shift power from this area to this area. Then that kind of response needs to be made here in real time. And then if I decide if that is going to happen, I need to send back the command to the hardware in the loop system to this digital train to say, hey, now we need to increase the generation on this part to compensate for the deficiency in this part. So this command sending to the system, then they were mimicking the consequence. We have three, four plans. So we need to decide which plan is the best. So this part of the simulation need to run faster than real time. You design plan A, B, C, and then we model the consequence. We say plan B is the best plan because it's uh, the least cost plan, the least chance will cause uh, congestion, uh, or the least cost for this uh, uh, energy price to jump up in this area, then we can execute plan B. So that's how we use this uh, kind of uh, digital twin. We can make better decisions because we can take the data and then we under uh, understand what will happen and then we tell the grid what we should do. And then once you decide that in the simulated system, you can send the, the command to your actual system through the communication to do a better control for your real-time system. So that's the design consideration. So now is a high level consideration. I'm going to give you a few uh, examples to see how this is actually implemented. So this is just a, um, a, a comparison uh, for the existing model and our model. If you're interested in, you can dig in to these uh, references. So the first thing we do is we model the dynamics from microsecond, like the switching, but you see inverse, they're switching at microsecond level. And then they are very fast, single phase. And then we can model them using phaser model, which is millisecond. So when we model these uh, different uh, system together, they are asynchronous simulation. Because we run them on different platform, this is possible. But we need to add an interface to communicate with uh, each other. So this circuit will know what happened in the microgrid. And then the microgrid take the information from the whole circuit, decide what is next mode. So we will have to consider the dynamic response inside different systems and then simulate them in an integrated fashion. And then second, we need to model the control. You can see here, this device level controller and system level controller, they have an interaction. For example, if I'm a DR aggregator, then I talk to all these different resources like grid forming, hybrid energy system, which have uh, perfect control. We can have demand response. Some of them are on, some of them are off. So the off ones may not be able to use at this moment. Similarly, we have these grid following DERs. Some of them, the communication link may be down, some of them may not. But uh, we need to model this uh, device level controller, how they can interact with system level controller. So this allows us to do that. Once we have this kind of simulation, we can train machine learning agent. So this is one application for our uh, digital twin. We have this environment, we simulate the high fidelity uh, models that uh, when we take an action, the environment will tell me whether or not there is a congestion, there is a voltage violation, there is an over circuit, uh, um, overload circuit. Then it will give me, tell me, you use this control, I'll punish you. You use this control, you solve the problem, I will reward you. So the first thing that we can enable is for you to use this environment to train your machine learning agent. Because when you have a simulator, then you can tell this environment what you do instead of going to the actual grid 
and then train it in field because that will be cost uh, um, prohibitively high because nobody will let you train your agent uh, in field because you can cause a blackout, right? So this is the first use of it. And then the second use of it is that we use it to simulate a server attacks. Because we can model not only this, but also the communication links, what we can do is that we can actually model how at each this place you can inject some fake data to bring the system down. Especially if you have distributed energy resources, then you have millions of these resources you want to control. What if some of these uh, um, people control the certain link and then put uh, these uh, malware on this link and trying to bring your system down? So this is one thing we do. We use reinforcement learning based uh, approach trying to uh, design the attacker or the defender. Again, this requires us to use this environment because this environment will send us uh, data. And then depending on how you set up this uh, scenario, you can attack either this uplink or the downlink. This is a monitor link and this is a control link. So you decide what you do. And then for example, our student is studying, this is his thesis, you can reference to it. We can attack the, the, um, the battery unit because if we can attack the battery unit, we can make you believe that uh, my battery is fully charged. But in reality, already these charges are. Why this is important? Because I can target a three o'clock, I deplete your battery. And then after that, you have no opportunity to charge it anymore because PV is out. So for the rest of the day, you have to shut down. If this happened to be a system supplying critical load, you can imagine, I let you believe that you at a charging level higher than you expected. What will happen the rest of the day, okay? So this is another use of this uh, high fidelity simulation system. We can model several attacks because we can model the consequences as if it's in field. But in field, nobody will allow you to do this kind of study because uh, you just cannot inject these fake data to a real system. So this is another use case. Uh, let me see if you can do this in that way. Uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, so uh, when we do the, um, this environment, we can design different uh, uh, microgrid energy management system. This is our system. What we are doing is that we try to see if we have a different microcontrollers, how I can control this circuit. And then the next thing we would do is actually, let me see here. We can see how at a system level, we can coordinate these uh, two microgrid. You can see that uh, when we coordinate that, if I have more resource, I can supply a larger area, like this area two is enlarged and area one is shrinked. So when we do this, we can not only design individual microgrid controller, but also design system level coordination. We can also do like a microgrid merging, meaning we merge these two together. So giving us this uh, kind of a high fidelity simulation system, we can not only design develop this, but also we can test that in different kind of uh, scenarios. So this is how we use uh, these models. Um, so this is the design philosophy and then how we can use that. Let me check the timing. And then the next, uh, I will talk about uh, some uh, data related uh, uh, work. Because we have this test system, we have to make sure it uh, represents enough scenarios. How we are going to do that? In reality, utility have uh, this data set, but uh, these are classified and proprietary information. But uh, if we want to train an agent, we need uh, a huge amount of data. If utility won't want to give me that data, what could I do? And then usually what they can say, uh, they, they will give you is say, hey, I'll give you 15 Peter to start with, and then use that development methodology and tell me what you can do. But what's the problem of that? When you use only 15 feeders, when thousands of feeders out there, then this data, even though you can use it to develop an algorithm, it's not going to be generalizable because if you use this feeders here, but you don't know if the typology change, the load change will happen. So how we are going to solve this uh, data um, deficiency problem, especially in this world that, that everybody is holding tight on their data set and refuse to share it. So what we're trying to do is uh, we're generating the synthetic data set. We use real data as an input, and then we develop a machine learning algorithm. Uh, we use a time-based model, which is uh, used a lot in image processing. We use this uh, uh, realistic uh, data feeding into this generative model, and then we generate a deep fake topology. Deep fake um, load profiles. 
so that we can represent the different kind of operation conditions. But they are generated from actual data set. So like I learned from a 1,000 uh, faces, and then I can use that to generate people's face and then ask this machine to recognize that face, whether or not that's human or with the, the, with, where, which part of the country they're from, right? So again, recall this, that uh, we, our parsing model usually requires topology and the component model and then parameters. So today I'm going to briefly touch how we generate these uh, synthetic topology. Because you can see that uh, if we use only one topology to do the work, it's obviously not sufficient. So how we can use uh, this uh, actual topology, generate uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, topologies, allow us to try our developed method or work on different type of topology or not. And then next, uh, I'm going to talk about how to use uh, one set, of, like say 100 uh, or 1,000 smart meter data, generate millions of smart meter data, reflecting the actual user behavior. So here is our actual feeder. This is the HV system. A lot of research are done by HV system, which is standardized system, simulate everything. But you can see from our actual feeders, the shape, and then the load the location is very different from a uh, test system. So how we're going to handle that? One way of doing that is uh, this is an actual feeder. You can see it has a lot more detail than actually test system. So one way of doing that is directly taking this actual feeder, reduce them to different type of uh, models, and then use that topology. So this topology has the advantage of it's realistic because it's directly from the actual data set. It is an actual representation for that uh, topology. The disadvantage of this approach is when you have one type of topology, you only generate so many associated topology with it. It, don't, it doesn't have the diversity of it. So the approach we are applying is using this image processing way of doing that. We use the generator, a discriminator. We take uh, maybe 50 uh, feeders, and then we took even the parts of the feeder and put them in the generator. We generate a topology. We use discriminators to say, hey, this is the actual topology. This is a fake. So by doing this competitive learning, the generator eventually learned how to generate a topology. This discriminator will say, yes, this is an actual. So by doing that, we can use a limited number of actual topology, generate thousands of topology, have a similar characteristic, but the, it's can expand the topology range to a different uh, domain, a different uh, magnitude. That way we can use this to do a lot more study. You can see that uh, this is our deep fake topology. So using these uh, um, topologies, we can generate different shapes and then uh, for different uh, uh, branches. It's like a tree. We take a, a hundred tree, we look at the trunk, the branch, and then from that we learn to generate the shape of the tree, similar to these 100, but we can generate a thousand types of trees. And then use that 1,000 of the trees, we can train our agent to see if they behave all well in this 1,000 instead of only merely 100 trees, okay? So this is the idea behind that. It does have issues if you directly borrow this image processing um, software. First of all, this is an actual physical grid. When you directly generate a tree, if that tree is okay, you, you cannot climb, that's fine. But in the parsing model, if this model does not meet the physical requirement, you cannot use it. So you need to do post-processing. First of all, you need to run PowerFlow to see if this uh, voltage is within limit, if this uh, line parameter actually set up right, so it won't have huge voltage drop, which in reality will never happen, or you need to monitor the mode class. Because if you train it too well, you can see eventually load class, and then you want to generate a diversified uh, topology. So, in power system, although we can use uh, some existing um, state of the art too in image processing, processing and then speed processing, but uh, we do need uh, to use our domain expertise to fine tune the model or to check the model to make sure they work in the actual in, uh, system as well. So the next uh, is uh, the component model. After we generate the topology, the next uh, is to give uh, these uh, loads different shapes. Before that, we actually need a high resolution data. However, all the smart meter data is 15 minutes. What's the disadvantage of that? This is the 15 minutes data, this is 30 minutes data. But in reality, we want to model the dynamics. We want to model the sharp changes. 
So we need to know the high resolution data. This is very similar to image processing. You have blurred image, you want a sharp image. How you're going to do it? You train a machine learning model to see how you can compensate to this and then put the detail back into this blurred image. So what we're trying to do is that we take 30 minutes, 15 minutes data, we try to recover all these details. I won't touch the technical detail because we have a YouTube video here. Uh, you can check out this name of the student or go to my website. The YouTube video tells you about the details. But I want to convey this idea why we do that. Because in power grid uh, models, even though you want to study, for example, the demand response, overall the energy may be okay. But if your demand response turn on and off uh, hundreds or millions of devices off, 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 you will have a sharp, large change here. And then that could bring the system frequency down. So that's why we need to model not only 30 minutes average of power consumption, but also one minute power change instead of energy. We need a power range. So that's why we need to do this uh, super resolution. We did a lot of uh, our uh, fine tuning. First of all, we need to uh, talk about how uh, we can directly borrow that and then it will work, but actually it won't because uh, the loss will be different. So we do a fine tuning. So the fine tuning idea would be, this is the ground truth. This is our actual system data. This is before we polish this um, load profile. You can see that uh, it has a lot of sharp increases, which in reality will never happen. So we designed the shape loss function and then design this run function to force this uh, generated load profile to have a uh, um, similar ground truth uh, type of, uh, uh, over, uh, we call that, uh, we shape the, the upper ramp and then we have this uh, envelope to be similar. So that way we will be able to generate a very similar load profiles and then vary the ramping uh, characteristic. So when we use it to simulate demand response, we can do that. So the other thing about that is uh, how to make a load more realistic. Because if you model demand response, what people used to do is they'll take a load shape, say this is a 50 megawatt uh, circuit, and then every node on this feeder, they take the same load shape, and then they just uh, uh, normalize based on the transformer capacity. For example, this transformer is 100 kVA. It simply just divided this by 15 MVA and then times 100. So normalize that to the same shape. What's the disadvantage of that? Everybody have the same shape. They will actually have, a, everybody will peak together. Everybody will go to the value together. What's the problem with that? It does not have the diversity, right? Because in different part of the circuit, in reality, they look like this. Part of the circuit probably peaking here, part of the circuit probably have multiple peaks, and then this probably particular uh, load will peak here. So in order to model that diversity, we need to generate a group of load profiles together so that they bear not only temporal correlation, but uh, geographical um, similarity. Meaning, suppose uh, we are in the same neighborhood. We see the same weather, right? So our peak time probably be the same because if uh, we have this really hot afternoon, our load probably will peak at the same time. But if you randomly draw these load profiles from different area, they won't have that uh, temporal correlation, right? And then similarly, if we live in the same neighborhood, our square footage is the same. And then our living pattern problem will be the same, right? So you will have similar load profiles. So we want to capture that. So what we do is uh, we use gun based model, but we don't generate one at a time. Similarly, if you generate cat, you can generate one cat at a time. But if you pull all these cats together, they bear different characteristics. What if I want to generate a family of cat? What do we want to do? We want to have a group of characters reflected. For example, there's a cat mom, this is the babies, right? They bear similar characteristics. You can put different kinds together. That's why we developed a multi load gun to solve this issue. So what we do is basically, uh, we face a, a, a very interesting uh, issue. First of all, we call this uh, load profile to image. Meaning suppose we have 100 uh, uh, load profiles. We use color to represent uh, the uh, high and the low. This is a 1kW, this is 15. And then if we think about this one line as this, you squish them, but use the color to represent the power. Then when you generate a group of uh, load profile, it's like it generates a color patch. 
So by doing that, we will transfer these uh, load profiles into a color patch. And then using that, we can use the state-of-the-art uh, uh, GAN-based model to generate a picture. And this picture in the, uh, will, be, uh, will be decoded into different uh, load profiles. So one interesting observation we have is for a cat, if they're not belong to the same family, you can use a visual inspection, say, this is a fake, that is true. But for these uh, low profile, it's very hard. You need to be a professional, like working this area, knowing what this group, of, group level characteristic is. So for a general um, audience or the user, they won't be able to do that. So what we're doing is we use this uh, deep learning based classifier. We train a machine to tell us whether or not these loads are under the same transformer. So you can see nowadays, power system engineers, they're not just learning power system stuff. Instead, we do a lot of machine learning. Actually, my students find a job in Facebook, Uber, and uh, um, Apple, because they use these machine learning based methods to automatically generate uh, these profiles. And then they use this uh, machine learning based method to automatically generate uh, the, the parameters. So this is uh, right now how the power engineers will do. Um, so I'm not going to talk about too much. I'll briefly touch the parameterization as well. So for parameterization, you can see that we can have very sophisticated models, but they have different type of loads there. What could we do with it? Because if we have this many parameters, we need to populate these parameters. So one thing we can do is using load desegregation. So what we're trying to do is uh, we take this profile and then we decompose them into different uh, um, or different uh, transformer. What would be the possible load profile they have? And then for the buildings, if you have a smart meter measurement, what will be your HVAC load? Why do we need to know that? Because a lot of the demand response resources is HVAC or water heater, like air conditioner or water heater. So we take the smart meter measurement, we tell the user, at this moment of time, how much HVAC load is there? And then these are the resources you can use to beat into the market. Say, hey, I'm, I'm going to provide this much of a demand response. So we call that a, a real-time parameterization. Because we take your smart meter measurement, you immediately decompose them into um, the HVAC load, PV load, EV load, and then we tell you what to do with it uh, when you manage the demand response. So this is uh, more about uh, the uh, parameterization. The next thing that uh, you can see that uh, we try the, our, uh, we not only do this on individual buildings, so this is an individual building, and then we decompose what the HVAC is. We also try to uh, do them on aggregated uh, buildings, like 10 users. What would be the uh, HVAC load for these 10 users, 15 users, and 100 users? So once we take the smart meter data from a building, or take the measurement from a transformer, or take a measurement from a, a whole feeder, will tell the operators, here, you have this many uh, air conditioner load you can use for demand response. And then they will decide, okay, based on this, uh, I, I have a probably can, uh, can use a, um, 10, um, 20 kW. And then which user I pick. So if I have these users, I know each individual, I can see, at this moment in time, who's contributing the most, and I will pick that as a response resource. Instead of, uh, I pick 10 users, some of them, the HVAC load here is actually zero. Then I pay them the money, but they didn't actually provide any response. So these uh, kind of uh, uh, load dis disaggregation algorithm is very important as well. This is the number one uh, application the utility actually wants from us, because they want to see the efficacy of their current demand response programs. So the last one is uh, more on the energy management. Um, for this piece, when we develop the energy management, what we are trying to do is a uh, per-phase demand response. I think a lot of you probably will be interested in that, because this is a distribution feeder. And then usually, when you have a load, they're not supplied by three-phase. They're usually phase A, like the red, and the green is phase B, and then this uh, um, yellow is, or brown is a phase uh, A, B, C. They, they have different kind of colors. So when we do demand response, we do per phase demand response, meaning each demand response resource will report to me their phase and then their magnitude. Why we need to do that? 
Because for us to uh, do this microgrid control, you can see that uh, the three phase can be very unbalanced. This is phase A load, this is phase B, this is phase C. What's the problem of that? In the circuit, if I have phase A really, really high, my voltage will be distorted. And then my protection relay may not work. That's first thing. And second, the power quality may be an issue. Some of the motor load may not function. So if we do per phase demand response, what, I think I have two more minutes. I'll just cover this part, and then we'll start to get into the question Q and A. So what we do is uh, different from uh, most of the demand response we consider per phase. Meaning right now, even though I see there's no need, uh, I have enough power, I don't need to uh, respond to that, but I want to reduce the phase A load so that it will close to phase B and C to remove that imbalance. And then the other uh, thing we can do is uh, to uh, remove the arrow between the focus. Here, the focus is here, and then uh, my actual load is there. It's under focus. So if I do demand response, I can remove this condition. Like if I have under focus or over focus, I can use demand response to, to compensate for that. So you can see that uh, um, this is the actual load in a real system. You can see that for group A, this is a phase A load, and then this is a phase C load. So A and C are very close. But the phase, um, this is phase B. Phase B is almost like uh, um, one fourth of these two loads. And then this is the second group that uh, uh, phase uh, C and the phase A are close, but uh, phase A and B are close, but phase C is uh, lower. So in reality, this is often the case. So if in this case, you have different load group inside uh, this uh, feeder, what's the problem? If you have microgrid, and then I need to supply a different load, and then I need to maintain phase balance. If uh, this is uh, my power source is at, then I need to pick up group four because this group four uh, or group two and three would probably help me balancing the whole load. But if I only pick up one and two or uh, one and three, then I probably won't have a balanced load. So this will be unfair to certain uh, loads. This is another example. If I have uh, a uh, power source at two, this one is balanced. Then I only want to pick up another load group that have balanced load. I don't want to pick up grids A because if I pick it up, if I don't have demand response, it will make my load very unbalanced. So to group A, it's unfair. So that's why we want to uh, use demand response to remove this imbalance so that all the group can be served equally. So this is uh, another thing that uh, we are considering why we do load desegregation because then we can have a real-time monitoring of these uh, demand response resources. We can control the phase balance among these uh, uh, loads. Um, I think I'm going to stop right here because uh, I, I don't want to cover too many technical details. I don't think that's useful to you. I'm going to go to the conclusion directly. Um, today, I focus more on the digital twin phase uh, um, study. The digital twin phase can cover steady state and dynamic response all together and then it can model the communication links. By doing that, we will be able to let you test uh, your algorithms. And then we also can control this uh, communication delay. So when we do a load aggregation study, we use this communication delay to see if uh, uh, we have an error, will you still reach your control goal? So model the cyber layer is very important uh, as well. And then we talk about uh, the high fidelity digital twin require us uh, to compare, to use the field measurement to quantify our uh, digital twin so that it's uh, responsive and then it's also highly uh, accurate. It's not like a static model, use it all year long. Instead, uh, we uh, update our model parameter every hour or so to cope with the new uh, operation condition. So the challenge is still on the data acquisition side because each time we, you have a limited data set, you need to try to use a synthetic uh, uh, way to augment the data. You generate a lot more synthetic data set. But if the synthetic data set is generated from a very small group of data, then your synthetic data set can only reflect the characteristic of the data given. So you still need to uh, get more diversified uh, um, those to start with, even though you generate a lot of uh, synthetic data. But you need to pay attention to the data you ingested. What's the limitation of that? Okay, I'm just going to end uh, my talk here. Uh, a lot of these uh, are actually the technical details. We also didn't have YouTube videos, so you can just go to my website and check the papers. And then if you're interested in certain machine learning technologies, 
you can just go and find the YouTube video. That should uh, give you more technical details. But uh, I think the high fidelity uh, digital training will be very useful for you to do machine learning uh, trainings and then also try your policy to see how the policy will work in this real world because it can project into the future by setting this uh, um, digital train to different uh, uh, renewable penetrations or different control mechanisms. So uh, there are a lot to be done, but uh, I hope that uh, if you are interested in this research, we can collaborate in the future. Now I'm happy to answer the questions. Questions? Hey, any questions regarding the modeling side, or um, what do you do? I don't think this group will do the model yourself, but I think you will do a lot of data processing, right? So um, what do you see that uh, um, for these type of uh, uh, test system, if it's out there, how you're going to use it? Um, I think for, uh, we, we studied a lot because we work with the utility engineers, so the planners and operators use this uh, a lot because they want to know when they implement the new control technology, what will happen? But so far, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, policy to use it. I just want to make a comment. Um, mm -hmm. We're actually doing something similar to this in bits and watts. Um, like, you said, fire so we just collaborate on one big grid. Um, we're looking at specifically like EV fast charging impacts on future grid systems. And we're really focused on like high fidelity storage models. So we put it on lab. Yeah, this is uh, very interesting because uh, we do have this uh, kind of uh, uh, work right now is ongoing. I didn't mention that. So this is our test system. So what we're trying to do is uh, we actually have access to the data from uh, uh, over 100 uh, households and then from uh, 10 uh, Tesla charging station. So we're trying to use uh, this uh, synthetic way of generating those. So based on this 10 house, uh, 100 household and then based on this, uh, say, 10 Tesla charging station, we want to generate a lot more charging um, profiles similar to that. So we can populate into here because each uh, this distribution feeder will supply a thousand of load, right? If you only have 100 households, you won't be able to study their behavior. So that's why we're extrapolating them to see if we generate the synthetic data set, can we populate that these, uh, say, in the future with 100% uh, EV penetration? Then how this uh, feeder is going to model that? Whether or not it's going to overload our transformer here or uh, overload our line here. Um, so that's the way we use this uh, synthetic data for, as we collect a limited set of data, because right now the EV data is very practical. You just have tens or hundreds uh, um, available for one year right now. I don't know how, in your study how many you use right now. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's a good point. I think that's another place because um, we've done two separate projects, specifically one using the, the generative actual networks for uh, EV load generation. Um, we did that in 2021. And then we also did another project using like about a couple, three million EV driving sessions uh -huh. to kind of create a statistical based model and looking at the different driver groups and Charger behaviors to generate like EV charging profiles as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's like I think there's a lot of synergy between what we're trying to do and, and what we're doing as well. So yeah, statistics actually is another uh, parallel method. You can use statistics, meaning you can decide uh, the uh, probability uh, when you charge, when you're not charging, and then develop that way. So yeah, yeah, I think that's another way of doing this uh, kind of synthetic data set. Right. I don't think the the, the, the generative actual networks are superior because they can capture, as you said, those spikes um, that happen at the minute. Yeah. Very important for, for more like the more Yeah. The main reason we use generative method is also because it's automatic. Because yeah. we use statistic, we we started with statistic method, but uh, you see, when you generate the one thousand, uh, like you say, a million. Then you have to set up the, the parameters, right? If you uh, you make the machine learn that and then generate that, it will be far more efficient. If in the future you want to generate more, it's more like uh, when you're trying to generate, uh, uh, like say, ten fake uh, human pictures, you can draw them, right? But it's very slow. But if you let the machine uh, learn that uh, good enough, it suddenly can generate a million uh, faces. So we the reason we use that is the automation part.
But I think that's a very good um, research direction. So any other, one want to share your research and how this can be used in your um, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.